All right, we welcome you today to Stephenville, Texas, to the Glory Bound Baptist Church here at 2283 Northwest Loop. Now, if you don't know where that is, it's right next door to the Baker's Donut Shop. And I'm telling you what, they got good donuts there. We know because we have them every Sunday, right, church? I just love Amen. them, and you can tell I love them because I'm just getting bigger by the week. <clears throat> anyway, we're glad you're here, and we're in the we're getting ready for the fall. School has started. Today's the first day of September 2013, and last Sunday we started a sermon series on baseball. I love baseball, and I told you about that last week, and I know you love it too. And if you don't, maybe you should. I just pull your leg on. That. I know everybody likes baseball. It's our national pastime. And last week. We talked about going, hitting the ball and going to first base. Remember we talked about that last week? And today we're going to have a little bit, we're going to add to that. And then next Sunday, the Lord willing, we're going to add to that. And then, the, then two Sundays from today, we'll have our last sermon on baseball. And it'll be in playoff time, I'm pretty sure about that time. And our focus will be switching to our favorite team, who might be, who, who could be the Texas Rangers. Maybe they're going to get into the playoffs this year, we don't know. I don't really follow the things. You know what? I follow them about a week before, and then I get excited because I know that they're playing for the real marbles, you know, as it were. And uh, everybody's planning to get into that postseason because it's real important. But today we want to talk about going to second. Going to second. Okay, so what happened? First of all, what happened? Well, you know, last week we talked about when you go up to bat, you hit the ball, you get to first, and then after you're on first base, what do you want to do? You want to go to second base. Why? Because that's, that's how the game is played. And then you want to go to third, then you want to come home and score for your team. And you know what? It's always good to come around, home, come around third and you're coming home. And it's always good to step on that plate and know that you got another run for your teams because you want to win. Amen? I don't care if you're playing for, for nothing or you're playing for all the marbles that there are or all the money in the world. You want to win. And uh, <clears throat> when we talk about the Christian life now, we, remember we talked about God's baseball game, and it's everybody's involved. doesn't matter who you are or where you live. We all have to come to bat. God is pitching the pitch, and He wants us to hit it. He wants us to go to first, and that means He wants us to be saved. We saw that last week, and it was if you didn't hear it, then it, it's on the video, so you can get it from last week if you haven't heard it before. But anyway, we're here and, and uh, talking about going to second. Now, what does it mean to go to second? Well, in baseball, it's real simple. You're on first, the idea is to go to second, to third, and then home. Now, in the Christian life, if we get saved, that means we're on first. And what God wants us to do now is to go on to second base. Now, doesn't that sound logical to you? Amen, Brother Ron. That's logical. That makes sense to me. He wants us to go to second base. All right? Now, what does that mean for us as believers? We remembered last week, we're up to bat, and God throws us the pitch of the gospel. We swing, we hit it, we, the ball's in fair territory, and we go to first, and we're, we're safe on first. That means we're saved. Okay? Now, we're on first, and we know several things. We know that God wants us to go from first to second, because that's His will. That's what you do in a baseball game, and that's what you do in God's plan of Christianity is you go from first to second base. But what does that mean? Well, going, from first, going to first means you get saved. We all agree, amen? amen? Now, going to second means, in the sermon today, we're trying to make this emphasis, is that we become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because being saved and being a disciple are two different things. Okay? And I, I want to quote you now, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Jesus said, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then to teach them all things. In other words, to make them disciples. And what is a disciple? That's one who's following the Lord and he, who is living by the rules of the of the game, as it were. Remember we talked about that last week. If you're gonna if you're going to score, you have to be within the bounds of the game and live by the rules of, of, of that game in order to score. So in the same sense, if we're going to be a disciple of the Lord, there's certain things that we have to do if we're going to make it to second base. All right. Now, let me ask you this question before I start. Is it God's will for us to be on second base? What do you think? Amen. It is. Amen. It is. And so we, we want to remember that as we go through this list and as we talk about it, because it's real important. Okay. 
And it's, it's why we're here today. This is part of what being a disciple is. I'm doing this for you because I'm helping you now to get, get to second base. If you're not on second, we want you to be on second base. And I hope every member of our church that's not here today, Clay and Terry and others that aren't here, Peggy, I hope they get to listen to this because it's for them too. Amen. God wants us to be on second base. Amen. All right. First thing we have to do to be a disciple and to be on second base, first of all, is to be saved. you got to be saved. You know what? I don't care if you want to join the church. If you want to do it the Bible way, you got to get saved first because that's the pattern. You get saved. And then the second thing is you have to get baptized. Now, we need to remember that getting saved and getting baptized are two separate things. There are churches that teach in this world that if you get baptized, you're saved. That's what salvation is. And I'm going, what? Where does it say that in the Bible? In fact, i got to tell you, I like to watch Fox News. And as you know, we've been having all this debate on about Syria and all these things going on. And you've been probably watching as much as I have. And they had a fellow on there that they were interviewing on Fox News, a man who was talking about a Baptist. He was talking about President Obama's beliefs and how that he believed that he thought he was a Christian and blah, 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 blah. And it, here's what he said that really got me jumping up and down. He said, well, when I was young, I was baptized in a Baptist church and therefore I, I was saved. And I said, did I hear that right? So I have on my television, I can back it up, because it automatically is recording it even if I don't push the record button. So I backed it up and said, what did he say? Now listen, he says, well, I got baptized and I was saved because I was baptized. I thought, that isn't what the Bible says, because baptism is a good work. Baptism is something that you do because you are saved, not to get saved. Because if you can get, bap if you can get baptized and by your baptism be saved, that means that the power of the salvation is in the water. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. It's the blood of Christ that's applied to our hearts by faith that makes us believers in Christ. And you remember the thief who died on the cross? He said, Lord, remember me today when you come into your kingdom. And on that cross, just before he died, Jesus said, today... Thou shalt be with me in paradise. You remember the story, Matthew chapter 27. And there it was, and Jesus told him, Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Now that thief that died on the cross, he was nailed to that cross. He couldn't get to his wallet because his hands were nailed to the cross. He couldn't go and be baptized in the River Jordan because he was dying on that old wooden cross just like Jesus was. And that thief is in heaven today just as sure as Jesus is. And we're going to see him someday. I can't wait to meet him. How about you? I want to talk Amen. to him. I want to say, tell me what it was like. And he's going to tell me. I'm going to go, man, I'm glad it was you and not me. Because, you know, I talk about deathbed repentance. He got it. You've heard that term before, haven't you? Getting saved just before you die. Well, he got it. And I guarantee you he got saved not because he got baptized. So you know what? Salvation and baptism are two different things. We need to remember that biblically. Very important. And it's one of the things that we believe is biblical, and that's what we teach here at Glory Bound Baptist Church. So you got to get saved, you got to get baptized. Now to get saved, there's a verse in Isaiah I want to give you. Isaiah 45, 22 says, God is speaking, He says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. We need to be saved by the Lord. It's not a church. It's not a movement. It's not a man. It is Jesus Christ. It is God who saves us through Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the only one who died on a cross to save us. And God accepted his death as the perfect sacrifice for our salvation. Now I can die for you or you can die for me. But if I died for you and you were depending to be saved because of my death, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're not going to heaven because of me. You have to go through Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right, now you've got to get baptized. And I've already said, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. And my question have you, to you today is, have you been baptized scripturally after you were saved? I hope so. We talked about this in other sermons. But I'm going through now the point after point after point about being a disciple. Because remember, the goal now is to get on second base. That's what we're talking about today in, our, in God's game, God's baseball game as it were. We're talking about getting the second. So you get saved, you get baptized. And thirdly, and you're doing this today, 
If I could come back there where you are and pat you on the back, I would do that right now. Because you need to be patted on the back for what I'm going to say. How does that sound? Because I want to encourage you today. Because you're doing this third point I'm bringing up. And the third thing we need to do is we need to be faithful in our church and Sunday school attendance. And every one of you were here today in our Sunday school. I'm telling you what, we emphasize Sunday school at Glory Mountain Baptist Church. Sunday school is, in, is, the, is the educational and evangelistic arm of this church. Sunday school is so important. And most churches don't believe that today. They think Sunday school, how, how blasé. How, how passé that could possibly be for today. We're so modern. We're in the 21st century. That's old school. Well, guess what? Old school still works, folks. Old school still works because the Bible is old school. This book is over 2,000 years old. And guess what? It still works today. Amen? Amen. And Sunday school is just as important as it ever was. And it's wonderful. And, of course, the verse I like to use is Hebrews 10.25. Where the Lord says, and in, in, uh, Paul wrote it in the book of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you know that there is a church, a big church, a famous church called the Catholic Church? And they say that if you go to Mass one time a, a year, you're okay. Did you know that? I lived in a Catholic country for 20 years. One time a year is okay. Now show me in the scriptures where that is. The Bible says in Acts 5, 42, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Paul said upon the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Let us, every man lay in store as God has prospered him. In the church, giving our offerings. And we do that by being faithful. And I want to say this. If the Lord came back today... And I had to give an accounting for every one of you. I would say to the Lord, these people were faithful to you and your word in our church. And I'm telling you as their pastor, I'm giving you a good report of our people. And I'll tell him. I'll let him know. If he doesn't already know, he already knows that. But I just want to reiterate the fact that you have been faithful and continue to be faithful. Praise the Lord for that. So faithful in our church attendance. And then David said it like this. In Psalm 122, verse 1, he said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, Sunday's my favorite day of the week. I wish we had Sunday every day. Don't you? Just think about it. No work during the week, Brother Bruce. Go to church every Sunday, every day. Wouldn't that be great, Brother Burrow? Come to church, and then we just, our biggest worry we'd have is where we're going to have lunch afterwards. Amen. <laughs> so anyway, I love Sundays, and I hope you do too. I know you do. All right, number four. Now we're talking about the steps of be, being a disciple and being on second base where we need to be for the Lord. Because we're all in this game together. Amen? All in this spiritual game. We're there. We're on the team if we're saved. Number four is a personal involvement in growing in the Lord. Let me say that again. We need to develop a personal involvement in growing in the Lord on a daily basis. Now, let me translate that. Those, those, are, those are preacher's words. Those are 50-cent words in a, in a sermon that maybe needs to be down to the 10-cent range. I don't know, something like that. But let me just kind of change it a little bit. What that means is, is we need to develop in our lives a, a life where we are walking with the Lord daily. Walking with the Lord daily. That means when we're at church. That means when we're at home. That means when we're at work. That means when we're out in the fields or when we're visiting someone or we're in a restaurant or shopping center that we are walking with the Lord. Now let me give you a verse. Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6. And you listen and it says this. As ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Now what is the Christian life? If you're a disciple, it is a day by day by day journey walking with the Lord. All right? And you remember when you get back to Genesis, now we're in Sunday school, I, I'm using flannel graph. And I'm telling you, I'm having a time because I'm going back to my roots, as it were. I like flannel graph. I had an aunt, she was a teacher in our, in our church. She was the best flannel graph teacher in the world. She just was an artist at what she did. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm very poor compared to what, what she did. But I think it's wonderful that you can have a no-tech teaching device where you can show people, and everybody's like this watching flannel graph. And if you're a pastor and your church isn't using flannel graph, let me encourage you. Go back to that no-tech. You can it's a wonderful method to use 
uh, way of telling people about Jesus. It's great. And you know what? We have adults here that even like it. And that's the truth. So listen, think about flannel graph if you're not using it, because we use it here at church. But what we're doing is we go, we're back right now in the book of Genesis, and we've been talking about the six days of creation. And on the sixth day, the Bible says that God made the animals that walked upon the earth, and he made Adam and he made Eve on the, on the sixth day of creation. And of course, on the seventh day, he rested. And, and, and when you get into the scriptures, you remember that Adam and Eve sinned. They ate the fruit that was prohibited. They fell from their perfection, and they were hiding from the Lord. Now, you're going to lose me for a minute, but I'll show you. This is what Adam and Eve did when God came looking for them. They did this. Is he gone? No. God knew where they were. He said, Adam, where art thou? Adam, where art thou? And over in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Stop here a minute. Look, never hide yourself from the presence of the Lord. You're going to be in deep, deep water and trouble if you run away from God. Christians want to, you know why they want to run away from the Lord? It's because they're doing things they shouldn't be doing and they don't want to be convicted about their disobedience before the Lord. That's what was wrong with Adam and Eve. They were under conviction about their sin. They knew they'd done wrong. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called out to Adam and said, Adam, where art thou? Now, this is the only time in the Bible here, Genesis, where it talks about God walking in the cool of the day. And you know what this leads me to believe? Is that before the fall, that Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. They walked with Him. They talked with Him. You know that old song that we love to hear sung and we like to sing? is I, I, In the garden. Remember that song? How wonderful it is. And, and, and uh, I wish I could remember the words. I'd sing it for you right now, a cappella. But you know the song, Walking in that Garden. And the Lord wants to walk with us just like Adam and Eve walked with Him in the garden and be close to Him. Now, not only does He want us to walk with Him, but He wants us to have a longing to learn more about Him. Let me give you the verses here. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul says it this way. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile, hypocrisies, envies, and evil speaking, verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. I don't know about you, but those verses tell me that God wants us to drink of the word, the simple word of God, and then to get into the meat of the word, which is stuff that's, that's more, more complicated, more theological, and grow and become strong in the Lord. That's what happens when you're a disciple. You're growing in the Lord and you're getting stronger. You were born as a little baby in Christ. As a, and he says here, you're a, as a newborn babe. And then you grow and you become a child. Then you become a teenager. Then you become a young adult. Then you become a mature adult. Then you become like a senior. And then you're like, and you have so much wisdom and knowledge and maturity. And that's what we need as Christians is that maturity in Jesus Christ. He wants us to grow. So we kind of understand that and we've heard it preached and taught in our churches. And the question is, how do we do that? Well, let me give you some suggestions today. First of all, do you know the names of the books of the Bible by memory? I know I keep asking this question over and over again, but I, it's, it's so important. Do you know them? Well, let's see. The first one's Genesis, and I think it's Exodus after that, and then maybe Leviticus. I can't remember. And then you say, that's about all I remember. You know what? Part of our problem as believers of not studying God's Word is we don't know the names of the books of the Bible. Let me tell you a little story. I read a book one time about new police officers. Years ago I read this, and the guy told about when he became a rookie cop after, after he went to police academy. You know what I'm talking about, right? He went to this precinct, and he was the rookie in the, in the precinct. And you know what they told him his first job was? They gave him a map of all of the streets in their precinct of their area that they had to patrol. And his supervisor said, now what I want you to do today is memorize every name of every street in our patrol area. Every one of them. 
And not only that, but the numbers that deal with the corresponding side streets. In other words, you know, like 100, 200, 300. They had to do that. And he said, I sat there and I read that over and over and over and over and learned the different names, how they were pronounced, so that when he's out in the patrol and they ask him on the radio, where are you? He can say, I'm at Crenshaw and Sepulveda, here on the west side. And they say, okay, good, we know right where that is. He would know without having to look at a map. And you know what, folks? We need to be learning the books of the Bible. He said, well, that's elementary. Yes, it is. But it's something we need to do because it will help us to grow in the Lord. It will help us to have more of a desire to study God's Word. So learning the book. So a question, do you know the names of the books of the Bible? We need to learn them. All right, secondly, we need to begin a personal daily Bible study program of some kind. Now, you know what, guys? I'll just be honest with you. Going to school was not my favorite thing. Anybody else like that? School was not your favorite thing. You know what my favorite time at school was? Recess, lunch, and get out of school. <laughs> Those were my three favorite times. Well, gym was okay, too. That was all right. Because I got to go and play and do different things. But the rest of it, you could take it and throw it in the, in, the, in the trash heap as far as I was concerned. I didn't want to study. I didn't want to do homework. I didn't want to hear the teacher tell me over and over and over and over. I don't want to hear that. I don't care about geometry. I don't care about what's happening in Afghanistan. I don't care about any of that stuff. Because school's not interesting. But you know what? You have to do that if you're going to grow. And Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, not man, but God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I've said this before. Would you know what to say to a Jehovah's Witness if they came knocking at your door this week? Would you know what to say to them? To give them something from God's word about the truth? Well, that's pretty hard, Brother Ron. I know. You see how important this is? Because guess what? We have the truth. And yet we're so unskilled in God's word, it doesn't speak well of us as believers. You know, we say, oh, oh, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for saving me. And we just want to stay on first base. We don't want to go to second base. But God wants us to go to second base and get there and be saved and be a productive Christian for Him. So we need to learn the names of the books of the Bible, be in a daily personal Bible study. That may mean reading one verse of the Bible a day. If that's all you can do, I say, go for it. Do it. It's, it's more than you're doing now. Amen? One verse. I don't care. It's fine. Just start somewhere and get going with something that you can do. All right? Number four, spend some time every day with your spouse reading something from God's Word. What? You want me to sit with my spouse and read with my spouse a little bit of God's Word every day? Yep. Why? Because it does several things. First of all, it brings you closer together as a couple. Did you know that? It brings you closer together. And guess what? This person you're sitting next to is the person that you're closest to on this planet. So you should be sharing something about God together. And this is something that you can do together. Thirdly, it will help you both to grow spiritually. Remember we're talking about growing in the Lord? Well, guess what? If you're sharing this with your spouse and, and visiting about this verse or verses, it will help you. And, and, and not only that, but it will help you, it will help prepare you to talk to somebody else about the Lord. Now, isn't it hard to talk to somebody about Jesus? How many of you have ever talked to someone about the Lord in a private conversation with verses? Dottie's done anybody else? It's not fun. Sometimes if you don't know the person, it's hard to do. But if you're speaking to your spouse at home, and you're sharing a verse to it, and you're talking about that's God is getting you ready and primed to be able to talk to someone else about the Lord when you get the opportunity. You see where I'm going with this? How important all this is? And then not only that, but it'll be something that you can do, you and your spouse, that Adam and Eve did in the garden. They didn't just walk in the garden, but they walked with the Lord, and they were talking with Him together as a couple. Wow, that's deep. I never thought of that. I know. That's why I'm talking about it today. And then, not only that, but it will bring you closer together. I, you know what? Most couples say, you know what? We're not as close as we used to be in years past. Well, I guess what? i got something to help you get closer. Talk about the Lord together. You know, about Him and about this Word, about our church and other things like this. It'll help you. And not only that, but it will help strengthen your marriage. 
Every marriage in America today needs to be strengthened. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've been married 80 years or been married 80 days. Your marriage needs to be strengthened. And one of the ways you can do that is to spend some time together in talking about spiritual things.